My name is Agnes Verdes. Today I'm conducting an interview with Mr. Ernest Schwerin in Westwood, Connecticut on December 11, 1996, and the language of the interview is English. My name is Agnes Verdes. Today I'm conducting an interview with Mr. Ernest Schwerin in Westwood, Connecticut. Today's date is December 11, 1996, and the language of the interview is English. Good afternoon. Could you tell us your name, please, and spell the last name? My name is Ernest Schwerin, S-C-H-W-E-R-I-N. How old are you, Mr. Schwerin? I'm 70, 70 years old. And when were you born and where? I was born in Berlin on February 16th, 1919. Could you tell us your father's name? My father's name is Hans. And his occupation? He, is a, he was a physician. And your mother's name? My mother's name is Erna, and her maiden name is Gut, G-U-T-H. Can you tell me something about your life at home as a child? Well, I grew up in a very protective childhood. Uh, my father was my best friend. He would go to all the museums with me, which he absolutely not necessarily must have loved. Uh, I, I never was hungry. I was well protected against everything, and uh, I went to school in a grammar school in, in Berlin for four years, in, in, in West Berlin, in, in Wilmersdorf, actually. And uh, then I went to a gymnasium. That means I started out in Latin, and then I was supposed to take Greece, Greek, modern Greek. No, old-fashioned Greek, excuse me, and uh, because that's what my father wanted. But at that time, I had to take French, too, and I thought this was really too much. And I went over to the uh, mathematical t uh, side of the schools, where you had French and English only, and mathematics. And the school was the Bismarck Gymnasium, which uh, was in walking distance from where we lived. And uh, I had uh, really a lot of school friends there, and uh, I had not to suffer under any anti-Semitism at all. Even so, in that school, there were lots of feudal people from Bismarck. We had a von Bismarck in our class, for instance. Uh, the teachers, well, maybe in looking backwards, maybe there were some Nazis, but I, I can't really say for sure. I was always treated quite quite well. And uh, now because it's in, in the situation in, in Germany with the Nazis coming in, in in 1933 and their laws being hard, tougher and tougher on the Jews, uh, it was decided that I should immigrate from Germany and uh, I wanted to go to Australia. And in order to do that, it would be a good idea to learn something practical. So I started to learn Mason in East Prussia in summer, and in winter I went to an engineering school, an engineering architect school. And uh, my older sister was studying in France in Paris, and my younger sister lived, of course, at home. She went to school, and I had to be in summer in East Prussia, and in winter, of course, in Berlin at home. And uh, then, in 1939, things became more and more difficult. In what way did they become difficult? Beg your pardon? Can you describe in well, what way things well, became difficult? Well, in all kinds difficult. of things. We, we had to move because the Nazis didn't permit my father to live somewhere else where he didn't have the practice, so we had to move. And uh, then we were thrown out of this and had to move to another uh, area, which was very, pretty bad area, really, in Berlin. And uh, it was difficult for, for them because uh, my father was not used to being treated like a, 
like uh, like an animal, really, in a way. And uh, he worked as a physician, and, and he worked in the Jewish hospital. And uh, then he was not allowed to be a physician. And he was called a Jüdischer Krankenbehandler. Which, which means? Which means that you were a physician, but you were not allowed to have any Gentile patients unless there was an emergency. Then you were forced to do anything they, they wanted you to do. So in order to, to find a way, and for instance, there was another thing in, in 1938 in Reichskristallnacht, uh, the result was that uh, you could not have any employee household employee, female household employee, under 45 years of age because, uh, you know, <laughs> the Nazi laws were so crazy. They thought something could happen to this poor woman who... Uh, we were not allowed, for instance, to go to theater or movies or anything like that. You had to sit on special benches if you want to sit in a park. Uh, you were not allowed to go in certain sides of the street where there was a ministry, you were not allowed to walk along there. And there were other uh, laws which seemed to be rather ridiculous. Such but, as? Hmm? Such as? Can you name some of well, them? Well, such as, I mean, Viertel Jude, Half Jude, Half Jewish, Quarter Jewish, uh, Full Jewish. I mean, that, that seemed all very remote, and nobody ever knew anything about this before. And what uh, one lived with this, and, and parents say, well, it can't get worse. It's always the last thing. It can't get worse. It can't get worse. So then, but they, I had a, an, an aunt living in England, and she wanted my sister to come in a children's support to England. And that was very hard for my parents because uh, the little girl, she left Berlin when she was uh, 13, 12 or 13 years old to go to England and uh, of course I never saw her again. So, so that was very, very hard. Uh, they couldn't, because the war broke out, they couldn't even send her baggage. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, I uh, worked in a I got a job in an engineering office, which uh, I liked very much, and uh, the boss there was really a communist because he lived in Russia and had worked in Russia. And uh, he protected me very much. And this was a small office, and interesting enough, we worked on the Volkswagen Werk in, in, in uh, Hanover, near Hanover, and we did the powerhouse. And only as an aside, when I was uh, back in Germany and uh, picked up a Volkswagen, there was a powerhouse was still there. That's very strange. Now, you picked up a Volkswagen recently? No, after the war, much after the war, much longer after the war, when we traveled in Europe. So, but that's only an aside. Uh, uh, my father couldn't work, so consequently he started reading Greece, Greek again and uh, wrote uh, the history of the family and made untaf and made uh, things like to find out uh, who our forefathers, our uh, grand uh, grandmothers and, and war grandmothers were and so on and so on. So uh, he suffered really quite a lot under this because that was hard for him. It was very hard for him to sit at home and, and not to have to, can't do anything. And, uh, I then went, worked in, in the engineering office, and suddenly one day I was called to the labor uh, office, and they put me into forced labor. I had to stop in the engineering office, and I did forced labor in a German muni munition, munition factory in, in, uh, outside of Berlin. It was a, this was a very large factory, and uh, there were about 
15,000 foreign workers working on about 600 Jews. And uh, there were some, the Germans were the, the foremen and, and so on and so on. There were actually, we were not treated that badly. We were not, I mean, we were not, uh, but we had to wear a star and then uh, another thing, such an armband. And um, luckily, after a while, I drove an electric car there. And so that I got around in the factory quite a lot. And I worked, by the way, in shifts, night, uh, morning, and afternoon shift. And uh, because of this driving around, I knew a lot of workers because you could help them with, this, with that cord. And uh, one day in, in, in 43, when... Uh, when I was still asleep, my father came in and awake me and said, listen, I hear that all the Jews will be picked up. Don't go to the factory. And I, and I said, well, you know, I have to go because I want to go to the sanitator because I have a carbuncle. He says, oh, he got very angry. He says, you always have to be right. So anyway, I went. And when I went to the station and, and walked along the platform, when I arrived at the station where the factory, I walked along the platform to the exit. A worker came towards me and brushed along and said, don't go, they wait for you. So therefore, I turned around and went back with the next train. And in that same train was a guy, oh, I, I was a star, of course, going to work. But then I covered it up with, a, with my <laughs> map, with the, what do you call it? Uh, the attaché map, every German carries such a thing. So uh, I got into the into the coupé and the uh, uh, train, and who was there? There was a guy who was in charge of all the Jews there. Now he saw me, he knew me, he didn't say a word. So, so I, I was not surprised, really. So there you can, uh, so I went back home, and when I, because I, where should I go? I knew only where go home. So when I went up in the apartment, uh, when I went to, uh, up the stairs, the door to my, our apartment was slightly ajar. And I heard my mother say, but why don't you let my husband drink a glass of water? He's not going to run away. So I knew who was there. They were there to pick him up. So I went downstairs and I saw they put my father in a in a in a lastwagen in a in a, a van, and he went off. So then I went back home, and at that time there was a telephone call, and it was a prostitute who lived in the house in, in the top floor, and she said, "Where's?" She said to my mother, "Where's your son?" And my mother said, I don't know, because you don't talk on the phone uh, about these things. So he said, so she said, listen, when he comes home, he can stay with me. Nobody will look for him. So this is what I did. You mentioned earlier that uh, you wore a star. When did you begin wearing a star? Well, the, the law was came in after 1938, I think 1941 I had to start wearing a star, 1941. Did your father also wear a star? My father had, no, he never wore a star. How is that? Because my second mother was Gentile. He did not have to wear it, but I had to wear it because it was only my second mother. You also mentioned earlier that you were only to sit on certain bench benches in the park and only to frequent certain establishments. Uh, sure. Most places did not allow Jews in. But only, no, wait. You were only allowed to purchase uh, things after five o'clock in the afternoon. You were not allowed in daytime. You also mentioned that you traveled to work. How is that that you... You, you got a special permit to do that. 
but you were not allowed to use any otherwise any tramway or buses or railroad or whatever. So how did people get around? They took off the star. Like I, I mean, I got around by taking off the star and go wherever I wanted to. We're up to 1943 now. Have uh, were there a lot of Jews still left in Berlin? No, not very many. As you remember, there was an article in the Times that there were 10,000 Jews living in Berlin illegally. I don't believe that it was 10,000. I think it was 3,000. But when you took the Jews that were married to Gentiles, you probably got easily to 10,000. But you see, there was formerly there were 600,000 Jews in Germany and 100,000 lived in, in Berlin. So, Did you know anybody who was deported? Who was deported? Yes, of course, certainly. My, my uncle, my aunt, the children, and uh, people just disappeared. I mean, they're, they're, yes, there were lots of them deported. I mean, in the factory, for instance, where I worked, I worked with a young guy who was born in Poland. One day he had to, he was deported to Poland, just like that. Do you recall which year it was? That must have been 40, 42 most likely, 1942, because in 1943 I stopped, I mean, I didn't go anymore to work. So you were working as you you mentioned as a s slave laborer. Well, why why do you consider it slave labor? I, I <laughs> because the pay was very lousy. The, you got something paid, but it was very very bad, very bad. You got fennige, but uh, I called it forced labor. Forced labor. Yeah. So, but. Uh, you see, it wasn't so difficult for a young guy. I was a young guy. That was pretty easy, and I was strong enough. That wasn't wasn't really so difficult. But you see, the old guys and who were 60, 70 years old, and, and you know, they they had to work too, and they put all their medals on and on a on a white T-shirt, and they didn't know how to work. They didn't have the. They never worked like this, you know, and. Uh, what medals are you talking about? Medals? Well, Eisenhower Kreutz, uh, medals from the war, because all these people were in the war, in the first war, world war. Jewish people? Sure. Sure. I don't know if you are aware, there is a very large Jewish cemetery in Berlin. There are about, uh, I think, around 400,000 graves. It's a lot of, I mean, it's very old. And there is a cemetery for soldiers that fell in the First World War. Did so your father fight in the First World War? Well, he was a physician. He didn't fight. So yes, he was. A, yeah, he was a, from the first day to the last. He had to be in the army. But he did not fight. I mean. You mentioned that your uh, stepmother was not Jewish. Right. How did that affect the family, your father and you? How did it affect the family? Well, it it made certain things much easier. Because how did it affect them? When the Jews had to bring their jewelry and their silver, I mean, you know, the all these things, to the police and the furs and and whatever valuables, I had to bring my bicycle. Uh, my father always divided it, says this is hers and this is mine, so that we, and we never took the whole stuff to, to, so that was one thing. The other thing was, you see, I, uh, I was very much touched that my mother, my second mother, stayed with us. She didn't have to do this. She didn't need that. And they were trying to pressure these people to, to divorce or leave the husbands, the Jewish husbands. But my mother uh, stayed with us, very much so. 
and her, her family did too. So from that point of view, uh, well, she had, a, she had a very hard time after she was all by herself because my father was picked up. I mean, my father was picked up after I, well, maybe I should tell the story first that I went to Switzerland. In, in, after the worker warned me on the railroad station and I went back home, it was suddenly clear to me that I had to live, I couldn't live at home because that was dangerous for my parents and uh, I had to do something. So that started my, my illegal life in Berlin, which was not necessarily easy. But luckily it was made easier because there were two other friends that had the same situation. So that we, we met, we never knew where the other lived because that could be forced out of you. But we met every day in a certain place, not not necessarily all three or so, but uh, always two at least. And we spent the day together. We would go in the Stadtbahn, which is a railroad that went around, and you could, especially when it was cold or rainy, you could go in this and you just drove around it and, and change the, the, the carriage once in a while and things like that. So it was very important to, to walk with a purpose in the city, for instance. So we did a lot of things for other people because, you know, people were uh, asked to leave the city because of bombings. So we helped them to bring baggage to the train. We, we did all kinds of things. Uh, one of the nicest things was there was a, this one friend of mine and I, we were once a week at a family and uh, where we did all the dishes from the week and had to polish all the shoes that were in the kitchen. Now you see these families, all of them had dishes for 48 people easily. <laughs> so you can, say, you can imagine uh, we had a lot of dishes to wash, but for that we got a meal. That was very important. That was a very important thing because we were always hungry anyway. These were uh, not Jewish families. That was, they were a little bit Jewish, but not much. <laughs> what do you mean by a little bit Jewish? Well, the, the father was an editor of a very famous old German paper, the Morgenpost. And he drank a lot of alcohol. And he got a heart attack. He was, I think, quarter Jewish or something like this. And he got a heart attack because he cognac bottle fell on the on the <laughs> on the floor and all the stuff was lost. <laughs> and this was bad the people said, we said that. <laughs> he probably got a heart attack. No, these people were not, not Jewish. They were but they were they were friendly, I mean as far we, we knew them for a long, long time. And there was another family uh, I'm still in contact with them. There was a family, it was Peter Heilman. Heilman was the name, which was, of course, is a Jewish name. And the father was the red Heilman, the Rote Heilman, because he had red hair, not because he was a communist, but he was a socialist. And uh, Peter was my age, about. And uh, well, he's still living in Berlin, and I, if I visit him, I should go there, or he comes here. And uh, you see, the mother, the father died in a concentration camp. He was one of the first ones that was put in a concentration camp because he was in, in Reichstag. A what? I'm sorry. He was in Reichstag. He was a Reichstag abgeordneter. So, uh, so he was put in a concentration camp, and he was killed. And uh, the mother was not Jewish, and I called her Mutti Heilmann because she fed us any time we needed something to eat, and that was very important. Or we could go when we didn't know where to sleep, we could go there and, and sleep. So these people were people whom you knew, and they knew you were Jewish? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 
But then you see there were many people who did not know that they, I am Jewish. I, for instance, had the, false, the paper of my friend who picked me up from home who was in the army. And Tell me about that friend. How, how did that come about, that paper? Okay, well, this friend of mine, Wolfgang Kliegotke, was with me together in kindergarten in, in the grammar school and in Bismarck Gymnasium in Gymnasium. And uh, when the war broke out, he happened to be in Sweden and he sailed always a lot and I sailed with them because uh, the mother and my friend and I, we would run the boat and the father would come and visit us and we would sail on the Baltic Sea and, and all over the place. It was wonderful. And uh, when the war broke out, he was in Sweden and he couldn't go to the army. He, be, he that time was studying dentistry. He was a very smart man and uh, he went to the German consul as he was supposed to and they said, okay, you are excused and then he went back to Germany when he could and changed his study to medicine because he, and then he knew he would be half a year studying medicine and half a year in the army only. Otherwise he would be just in the army. So he was very friend. I mean, we were very close friends. And uh, he got from my father the microscope and, and books and all kinds of things. And But to make it short, when, when I lived with a prostitute up there for a few days, uh, he called and my mother said the same thing. I don't know where he is. And then he came. And he says, where's Al? Well, he lives away. And then he said to my mother, ask him to come down and he comes with me to his parents, to my parents, his parents. So that's what I did. So I lived with the parents. And that was not so easy because it was very dangerous for them. Number one, there were constant air raids. And what do you do? You go in an air raid shelter, suddenly some stranger is there, so you couldn't do this. You have to stay up there. And uh, I, I really didn't want to endanger them more as, as, as it was already. So they made a, a nice decision. He said, you can live on the boat. So I lived on a boat on a, on a big lake, on their boat, which was fine. Only at night it was when there was an air raid. It was terrible because air raid batteries, anti-air raid batteries, were around the lake. And when they are shot, you, the boat nearly jumped out of the water. So that was not so good. But uh, I, after the war, no, wait a moment, maybe I, sh I shouldn't go so fast. Let's, uh, <laughs> so the main thing now, living illegally in Germany or in Berlin was, of course, to get false papers because that is the only way to get uh, a little bit insurance that you can, can, can live and if you get stopped uh, that you have something to show. Okay, you want more? No. So you, you did get false papers yeah, and we're, not, not we're going to go into that on the next tape, okay? Okay, okay. sorry. I'm sorry. Don't say and today's date is December 11, 1996. Mr. Schwerin, we left off when you were about to get false papers. Tell me about how you obtained them. Well, this, this was one of the most important thing of, of all and was really all consuming to get false papers. And one g went different ways about it. One way was a friend of ours a Jewish friend, worked for the Red Cross, volunteered to work for the Red Cross. They didn't know that he was Jewish. And he sniped letterheads with the Red Cross on it and he sniped a, a, a stamp. So these things we made ourselves. We put a picture on the side and, and typed things in and stamped it and signed it. And that was a, an Ausweis. That was an identification paper. 
But it was not a very good one because anybody who looked very closely would find out. So that was one help. Now the other thing was I told you that I saw the guy who was in charge of the Jews in the train. And as he didn't say anything to me, I tried to get in touch with him. And I did. And he sold me a paper, a work paper from the Deutsche Waffen und Munitionsfabriken, where I put my own picture in and stamps. Now, that's a, a different story, I'll tell you right away. Now, in order to put a picture in, a, in an official document, you needed these eyes because they're not, the pictures at that time were not pasted on, but they were put in with some eyes which only the Cosette had done. A Cosette had this thing. Explain how that's done. Well, it's, it's a part like, it's two parts, and you press it together and it, it gives a ring, and that fastens the picture on it that you never could get it off. Okay, now they, Germans used two of these things, one in each corner. So now we had to find somebody who would do this. And <laughs> I got the name of a Cosette lady through somebody else. And this poor lady was very much in, in need of love, too. So one had to pay, in a way, <laughs> indirectly. Uh, which is maybe not very nice to say on a <laughs> but I got the my picture in in that paper. Now I had to look to have the as we called it the cuckoo put on each side, the German official stamp. So for that there was a I knew there was somebody who did this and I, he was a commercial artist. But I could not get directly to this guy, but indirectly, while well, he put the stamps on for me. And he did the same thing for my girlfriend. But I had a lot of trouble with the Cosette Madame to put the, her picture in the paper. Uh, then, for my other friend, who, the one that lives in, in Baltimore, we were swimming on the, on the half a and I saw somebody dried a verpass, which is an army paper. And I sniped this one because, uh, hey, you had to do all kinds of things. So he put his picture in there, and he traveled with this, and I traveled with the official paper from the, from the uh, uh, factory I worked, because a very known factory. What name was on that paper? The paper? I put a name on it. You know what? I thought about it. I don't know <laughs> the name I used. I, I did not use my name, I assure you. So then, uh, but because I had papers were so good, and my, my, my girlfriend had good papers too, we traveled second class. My friend had to be in the back third class, and we went from Berlin to Stuttgart. But maybe that goes a little too fast. You asked first how do you get the paper, so that's how we got our papers. Now comes the thing, how do you get out of Germany? Because that was really the whole thing, and who wants to stay there? Uh, we met, we met, I met really, a woman who was very religious, which, uh, and she had two sons that were in the SS. And we talked, and we talked about all kinds of things, and then it turns out that she had a cousin or some relative living close to the border, to the Swiss border. And she was more than willing to meet us in Singen and walk with us to the border, and her cousin will show us how we get over the border. So that was one big thing. And that's what really happened. Now my other friend, one in here in, in Westport, 
went one month before and he went with, a, with another woman and a dog and a big fur coat because this woman was Gentile and her friend was a singer who was Jewish, he was in Switzerland and she, she wanted to follow him. So they went and they went really through the Rhine which is not so good and he says, my friend always says, Mr. Dog, that was terrible. <laughs> but they went walking through the Rhine and uh, that's how they got in. But he got in one month before we got in. So then we finally had the papers together and now it was just a matter of taking off, really. So we went with a night train to Stuttgart and this was too not so easy because there was lots of bombings and, and uh, uncertainties and what happened and the trains were dark which was good, we didn't mind that. So we went and, and you were really, uh, there were Gestapo and police coming around to check the papers. But you know when you're in a dark coupe, uh, how the, how the, they don't see really anything. And the plane, trains were very, very crowded, very crowded. So we, we arrived in Stuttgart in the morning and uh, there was a big uproar because a bomb has hit the station and had inundated with water because the water main broke. 200 people who were in a, in a shelter underneath and they were all who knows what. So now here we were looking for a place to, to stay overnight. So we finally ended up in a Catholic hospice. In a what? Catholic hospice, which is a Hospice. It's a. It's not a hotel, but it's. A, it's run by by nuns, and it's really for Catholic people. But they took us in, and there were a lot of young priests who told continuously anti-Nazi jokes, which was very nice. It was very nice, and uh, there was only one condition: uh, she, the nun wanted to know if this lady. If we were related, I said, no, no, but then she has to be in another room and I had to be with my friend in one room. This was the most important thing. Okay. But uh, but you can see, uh, we were actually fresh almost, I would say. I mean, we, we it was very exciting. The whole thing was very, very exciting. So. We stayed there overnight and then we took a train, a local train to the border. And that is a train that you can almost walk next to it. It doesn't go very fast. And there really was no control on that train. It was interesting. And we got to Zingen in, it was almost dusk, it was late in the afternoon. And we met our lady and she took us, we walked towards the woods and it got darker and then we sat on a bench in the, in the water of the woods to look out something and suddenly a guy was or a person was underneath under the bench and that was the, the guy who told us where to walk to. So and we had to walk about I would say it was at least a kilometer. We saw the roads there and he said look when you see the bicycles with that little light driving by, these are the guards. Don't go over there, over the, the road. But when they are past, go over the road and you are in Switzerland. So that's what we did. What kind of guards were they? What? <clears throat> what kind of guards were they? They German or Swiss? Germans, German guards, Germans. This is the, the chaussee, the, the road was Ger in Germany still. So. Okay, and then uh, so we walked to this thing. We we stayed in the chaussee Graben, you know, and then we waited until they passed, and then we went across the street, across the chaussee, and got into the woods. And uh, my friend had 
was sick. He had a high fever. And uh, he said he doesn't go any further, so we had to stay overnight in the, in the woods there. Which was actually quite good because in, uh, this was cold because it was uh, end of October, middle of October. And uh, then because in the, when it got lighter, I went to the right. There was a German border. I could see the stones and I go to the left and I could see it too. So we, we may have well strayed back into Germany. So we went straight ahead and we wanted to go to Schaffhausen. And while we were walking there, suddenly somebody came out of the woods, a Swiss uh, border guard, and he asked us, what are you doing here? So I said, well, they said, we're Jews from Berlin. Oh, you're not deserters? No, we're not deserters. So you, but you have to come with me because I have to write everything up and uh, I'm not, and I said to him, are you going to send us back? Uh, you better shoot us. So he said, no, 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 I don't, we don't shoot because we have to clean the, lo the rifle. So he took us back to the, to the border and, and there was a Nazi flag on this side and the Swiss flag on this side and the, the, these, these funny looking things, you know, that you're supposed not to go through and there was a German standing there with a binocular looking at what's happening there. And uh, he took us into the, the house there, the like border garlic house, and he made a big protocol, and I picked out the, all the cigarettes, butts, because he didn't have anything to smoke. So then uh, he took us to a little, a little place where we were put in the, <laughs> in the local jail, which was really one room with a, with a there's a potty in there, and uh, a hole in the, in the door. There always was an eye on uh, continuously. And suddenly the door opens, and there comes a whole Swiss family in with pots and pans, and say, "Well, welcome." That's it. So we they gave us food, and they said, "You don't have to say thank you. It's from the joint, from the joint distribution." They pay for this, and uh, then uh, I had to put, put autographs. I've never given autographs before. So then they took us to a real jail in Schaffhausen by train, and there suddenly I saw bananas on the station. I'd never seen bananas and oranges. So anyway, so they put us in jail, and that was. Well, it wasn't so pleasant because they, in the morning they wake us up at six o'clock and put the put the bed on the wall so that you couldn't lie down, and of course each one was in a separate cell. And then they took our stories again, and uh, then after a week or maybe a little longer than a week, they took us to camp to a, what they called an Aufangslager, which means. Uh, uh, when when somebody goes comes over the border illegally, they put people in there. So there were lots of people there, and that was in a in a old hotel. And the first thing I knew is that the people didn't believe us that we were Jewish. They thought we were spies. So one guy came to me because I was the oldest of this group, and said to me. Would you pray with us on Friday night? I said, I'm sorry, I don't know how, but my friend knows. Okay. So once he did it, that was all right. Then they believed us. Oh, these were Jewish people in jail? Feel. Oh, n not in jail, in this camp. In this camp? Yeah. How come you didn't know how to pray? Because uh, I'm, uh, I didn't. When my father wanted me to have religious instruction, in uh, Jewish religious instruction. I did it a little bit, and then the rabbi wanted me to learn Hebrew, and I said, I have enough. I have Latin and French, and, and Hebrew now, that's too much. So the rabbi complained to my father, and my father said, well, what shall I do? He doesn't do it. So. But your friend knew <coughs> yes. how to pray? Oh, yes. Which friend is this? 
This is my friend who is in Baltimore, the one we went, went together who had the high temperature. Yes, he knows, sure. So. So now you are in this uh, camp. I forgot one thing to say. When we were in, that, uh, in the jail in Schaffhausen, we met another guy who was a guy who made the stamps for us. He was a commercial artist. He traveled by bicycle from Berlin to the Swiss border. And we met him in jail. And we were then together in camp and in, in labor camp too. And he visited me here. He has his own, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, you know, commercial art studio in, in Basel. So it's strange. So we were in that camp, and th that was not the most pleasant one because the food was terrible. We were always hungry. And so we volunteered first to be plumbers because the toilets were always stuffed up and, and because the food was so bad you had to urinate all night. And people were just standing on the, open the door to the thing and just did not very good. But that, that was very, very un, un, not hygienic and uh, everything was terrible in this place. So I and my friend, we both volunteered to help the, some Swiss uh, taking woods down because, you know, they needed more farmland. So that was very good because we slept in a bed. We got very good food. We worked hard. And then the next thing was I was called back. And they put me in a, in a labor camp. And that was in, in not far from Basel and not far from Rheinfelden. That was in Basel Land. How old were you at this time? 43. I was 24. So a labor camp is not, it's not a Gestapo thing. It's not, nobody works very hard. No, you sleep on, in, in military barracks, three up, you know, three up. And uh, it's usually, whatever, however people you meet, it's nice. So the first thing that happened to me, a guy came towards me and says, uh, What's your name, Ernst Schwerin? He said, do you have a sister, a name of Anna-Marie? I said, yes, she lives in Paris. He says, I know her. So this was uh, Hans Steinitz, who was the editor of the Aufbau, if you know that. And uh, Hans Steinitz was a, became a very good friend of mine. And uh, so you see, you met all kinds of people, and, and we had a we had, uh, had a very good time, and so far, you know, we had concerts, piano things. People came to talk to us. There were about 150, 200 people in camp. But we included, for some reason, the, the village visit, Merlin, and they loved that, the Swiss. They, they really liked that. They liked to come up there. That was, was an easy thing. And so then we had to work. Well, oh God, working was not so so hard uh, because I have an engineering background so they had to they gave me three people to work with and supposed to watch we didn't we didn't watch very hard we went when the cherry time was we had a lot of cherries to eat uh, apples cherries walnuts potatoes we dug them and, and we cooked them and all kinds of things so but then they sent me on this group down to the Rhine, to, to the River Rhine, to close old fortification that were there in the woods. We had to take the barbed wire off. and So we walked first down. That, that was almost an hour. And uh, you walked back, it was an hour. So you didn't work very hard. And mainly we didn't swimming in the Rhine. And this was very strange because <laughs> we didn't have any bathing suits, of course. So we were always arrested by the Swiss army as soon as there was a new rotated uh, army. Uh, they arrested us. They thought we came across the Rhine swimming. But if they arrested us, we couldn't walk, of course. So that wasn't so bad. <laughs> so 
we had a good time. As, in other words, what I tried to say is uh, these camps were, were really, when, when you were young, it was not hard. Did you at this point have any idea about uh, your family's whereabouts? Well, I tell you, I, I wrote a card, a postcard, home to Berlin, but I never got any answer. But my girlfriend from Berlin was in America, so I wrote, <coughs> I wrote to her, of course, and she wrote me, but then I lost her address, and I got all this back because I wrote her even a letter that I'm going to marry, but the letter never arrived. And uh, I got it back after a year and a half. And it was all cut out by the German censor, by the British censor, and there were different pictures in there. So she never knew that I wanted to marry the, the girl I went to Switzerland was. So this, this was funny. But you see, uh, in these camps, you got furlough. Every six weeks, you got uh, a week furlough. And you earned money, which wasn't very much, but you, they gave you a railroad ticket for 50 kilometers both ways. So, and you could go any place in Switzerland. There were, that was very good. So I could visit my, my girlfriend in Schaffhausen. But there again, I was not supposed to take the direct train because that went through Germany. I was supposed to go to Zurich, and so on. that was much more expensive. So I, I went the other way, and I went back through Germany, which was pretty foolish. But the, the, they closed the cars, they locked the cars, so what could have happened? Nothing. I mean, nothing happened, luckily. So that's, that's about it. So you were in this labor camp mm -hmm. <coughs> in 1943. How long were you there? I was there from, in, in Merlin, I was until February, February 1944, and then I got free to study. Tell me about that. Well, uh, we got, we were very lucky because the lady who was in charge of, from the joint to select people, she liked the, the three of us. So we all three got to free to study, which was really not, not fair maybe, but uh, that meant you got 150 francs a month and you lived with a bed and wherever you want to live, you had a rented room and uh, you ate in the university, in the mensa. And uh, hey, it was wonderful. It was wonderful because you see, look, you could go, you went swimming in the Rhine. You just have to watch that you don't end up in in Germany. And uh, we had a very good time. We had a very, and you made a lot of friends. You know the the commonly known Swiss, uh, the Swiss people. They were very. We, I'm still in, in touch with them. You were in a free country, yeah. even though you may not have been completely free. But you were in a free country. What did you know about what was happening in Germany and elsewhere in Europe to especially the Jews? Well, by then, by then, these things were uh, all over the papers and all over the radio. I mean, the cassettes and so on. And what, while I was still in camp, uh, Hungarian kids came from Hungary and they were put in camps, and the Swiss took them in. And uh, you see they took people uh, from Vienna, Austrian kids too. I mean, I know a kid, uh, smaller kids, they only knew that milk comes from a can and not, not from a cow, because they never saw a cow or milk. But the Swiss, Reluctantly, maybe, or not reluctantly. You see, these camps were under the police. Uh, but the 
die Volksstimme, if you want. So I mean, you see the public, uh, the public uh, relations for the politician was important. They knew that they were not against these refugees. They wanted to help because they felt very isolated. You see, the Swiss. This is like a museum in Europe. Okay, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, nothing was destroyed. The last war they had was in 1848. So they done, so they felt, and they, they called this, they had a name for that. That was a malaise, malaise. The Swiss Malays that, that they felt very very bad about it, and then on the other hand, the Allies did not. Uh, they liked the Swiss as long as that was a center of espionage and, and uh, all the thing you can imagine. Uh, but the Swiss had no direct way to import any foodstuff or anything, so they had their own. Navy, which is funny, a merchant marine they had. They, were, they had sh two ships that went under the uh, Swiss flag to Genoa, and that brought uh, food stuff and whatever was needed to Switzerland. But Switzerland has no coal, so it was very difficult. It was rationing, everything was rationed. and. Uh, the Allies, you see, were not too friendly to the Swiss because the Swiss had sold Erlikon guns to the Germans. And uh, so the Swiss were accused like they're accused now again, rightly so, by the way, with the money. But what did you, as an interested refugee, find out from the press what was happening in the war? Oh, that was easy to have. That was in the radio. That was all over. There was in the newspaper. That was was there continuously. I was still in camp when, for instance, Paris was uh, uh, liberated. That was uh, the biggest thing in camp you can imagine, because we had lots of French people in camp, and uh, the Swiss who were in charge of these camps in our camp wouldn't show their face. That was such a they were drunk, wine, all over. Boy, it was wonderful. So, you see, uh, no, we were well informed. We were very well informed. So you knew what was happening in Oh, France yes. Oh, oh, oh there's no question about it. No, 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 no. We were very well informed. And at that time, you see, it was very clear that the Germans would lose the war, so the Swiss government was not on the German side. We're going to change the tape now. Good. On December 11, 1996, Mr. Schwerin, let's back up a little bit to the time when you lived illegally in Berlin. Can you tell me about the kind of life you led and who you saw there and who you got together with? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't mention it before, no, uh, but but you see, there were certain things very very important. The important thing was, where do you sleep? Where do you eat? And and how do you keep alive? That was the most important thing. Really, the most important. There was nothing heroic. It was just keeping alive, really. So let me just back up a little bit. And how do you, how did I sleep? Well. I had the false papers from my friend, the Gentile friend who was in the army. So I went to people which I could see they wanted to rent rooms. They could get that in the paper, you can read it and so on. So I went there and I stayed usually in the West. And usually what you would find is that a lady was in, wanted to rent rooms. And she was very afraid she didn't want a Frenchman or uh, this or that. She wanted a good Berliner there, if possible, and if possible, somebody who was in the army, and so this, I was in the army, and I told her that I have people from the Rhineland who are bombed out at home, and I have to study for my medical examination, and uh, I don't want to change, I don't want to go to the police and tell them that I 
move from there to there. That meant for them that they didn't have to pay taxes. So I found I would go to this and I usually stay about three weeks and then I have to look for somebody else. So this is how I slept. Now how did I eat? And we, we bashed on that already. You, you uh, did things for people, you went to stand in line for people and then you got invited to eat. And uh, But that's for usually people who knew that uh, you were Jewish. Okay, now the other thing, you could go to restaurants. Now the food was horrible. Horrible, I tell you. And you need stamps for that. Now the stamps you could buy in the black market. But uh, <coughs> that was one thing. Now the other thing was you you went in a cafe house, like in Vienna or anything. In Berlin they had that too, but probably not as extensive. <coughs> but one day, for instance, we went to a place in in uh, Wilmersdorf again, and my friend went to get some cake or torte or cakes or whatever from the counter. And I was sitting down, and he came suddenly back white like a sheet. And he said to me, come on, come quickly, Stella Goldschlag is here. So now I have heard about Stella Goldschlag, but I never was in school with her. But he was. So he, she knew him, and she talked to him and says, Gerb, don't you know me? And he said, I don't know you. No, I'm not Gerb. So anyway, we ran out of, I mean, we rushed out of this place. Why was that? Why? Why? Yes. Because she always had a, uh, somebody along who arrested the Jews, and because she was looking for a Jews that lived underground like we were. So Stella Goldschlag was a very beautiful lady. She was very well, very good looking, and she was in the Goldschmidt Schule, which is a very good school in 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 the West and that later went to England. They went to England, they had a school there. And Stella was caught by the Gestapo with false papers. And the Gestapo wanted from, I mean, I know this out of the book, really. I didn't know it at that time. The Gestapo wanted from her that he finds, she finds a man who made the stamps and made the false papers for her. And that's the same guy who did it for us. So. She, she never found the guy because we met him in, in Schaffhausen in jail. He, he left, he, he got frightened and he left Berlin by bicycle. But that's Stella Goldschlag and Stella Goldschlag was later arrested after the war by the Russians and was put in jail and was put in jail when she came out of Russian jail by the Germans. And uh, what can I say? I mean, I. I don't like to throw stones because I don't know what I would have done when they forced me things to do things I didn't want to do. I mean, that's a, it's really presumptuous. They're not heroes. So that's for Stella. And, and uh, so the life, really, to live illegally was not easy. It was not easy because you have to move continuously. You can't, you have to look. You know, I had, uh, for instance, uh, long shaft uh, boots and I had, I had a sh official looking pants and uh, but we did funny things, crazy things. A friend of, our, the friend, the girlfriend of Peter Heimann, we talked before, worked for a general in, in Berlin and the general wasn't there and she said, why don't you come up and have a look? So. I went up there and I put on the uniform of the general, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. But uh, we're, we're dumb. I mean, dumb. I mean, those things you shouldn't do. There's no need for. So All this time, did you have any contact with your parents? Uh, yes, I had contact with my parents. But I did not go into the apartment at all at that time. But. When I needed something, I met my father. I did not, never met my mother. And the day I left for Switzerland, 
left for the train. I went there at night in the dark and went up to the apartment and my father brought me down. That was the last time I saw him. Now you mentioned earlier that uh, at some point they came to get him. Yes, yes. How, that, did, how did he get out? Well, because he was married to a non-Jew. And I don't know if you read in the paper, these people, the Jews were all put in the Große Hamburger Straße. That was a, uh, uh, next to the Jewish hospital. And there must have been a few thousand men. And the Gentile women of these men came to protest. And they made such ruckus that they had to close the street. And th th that's the way they got out. Now you said that when, after you said goodbye to your mother and father that night, that's the last time you saw your father. What that's happened right. to your father? Well, my father was in, I, I assume, see, I left, I left for Switzerland in October, October 10th. And in February, January or February in, in 44, he was ordered to the Polizei Presidium and was put in jail and was accused of help having helped illegally living Jews, which may be very true. So he was in jail I would say almost three months. And I wanted to bring you some of the, of the, because he wrote on newspapers on the side and he wrote letters to my, my mother. And uh, there was a, a guard who was very kind and he delivered this from jail to my mother. But then he was deported to Auschwitz. And of course that's it. What year was he deported? 44. 44 about June, I think. June, July. I don't know exactly when. Even though he was married to a Gentile woman? Yes. Sure. And my sister from, from France disappeared too. I mean... What happened to your sister? I don't know exactly. My sister was in Gurs in France, and then she got out of Gurs, and I know she married. And her name became Renard. I never met the man. I, all, when I was in Paris, I always looked for him, and about Renard, I said, name is Smith here. So my sister then disappeared, and I spoke to one of her friends, and they said that she, uh, they sent her to Auschwitz too. When did you find that out? I spoke, and the, uh, one of her friends called me in, 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 as a matter of fact, when I was still in Switzerland, I found that out, because I always tried to, to be in contact, but I couldn't really. But then my little sister uh, was in England, and of course I was in contact with her. And then I, I invited my little sister to come to Switzerland, and I sent her a ticket which uh, was uh, easy because a friend of mine went to Strasbourg with, with Swiss money and bought black, funk, uh, black, <laughs> black market money and bought a ticket for almost nothing from London to, to Basel to Adelboden to go skiing and back. So my sister came, I picked her up from the station and it turned out that she couldn't speak German and I couldn't speak English. So that was a very strange. So she stayed, and uh, we went skiing. She had never been skiing before. And then I bought her a whole outfit. Uh, I, I asked her to bring 50 pounds along, if she doesn't have it, to borrow it. Because she is a relative of mine, she was allowed to exchange it to the official rate, which was quite very good. So I bought a whole outfit for her. We went to Adelboden, we came back, and I bought, for the left of the money, I bought black market pounds, and she took 50 pounds back. So. Now, on the tape before we left off in Switzerland, when you were 
in uh, work camp. How long were you there? I was there from uh, roughly November 43 to about February uh, 44. You also mentioned that you were lucky enough to be chosen to yes, right. go and study. Yes. So then you went to study, what did you study? I, st I studied engineering really in, in Basel. I went to school in Basel and uh, now there when we had vacation we had to go back into camp. So that, that was very nice by the way, the camps. And because in summer that was beautiful. You did hiking all day long in the mountains. And where were you when the uh, war ended? When the war ended, I was in Basel, mm -hmm. and I was in a movie. And I suddenly saw on the screen that Mussolini was strung up in a, in a gas station and his girlfriend Petraccia, to their hung from the, from the, something in the gas station in, in Italy. That was, I tell you, this was unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, I knew that things were bad already, but to see these two be hung up there. So then the war was over, and uh, now you got pressured by the Swiss to go back to Germany. But I worked there, I worked in Switzerland in an engineering office, so the pressure wasn't that hard. But I didn't want to go to Germany, of course not. Why not? Well, what did it do to me? <laughs> my mother managed, my mother, I, my sister had my mother come to England, because that's her mother anyway, which was very, very good because she was in a terrible shape. So now, for me, it was a question, I, d I didn't want to go there. Now my girlfriend was in the States, so she tried to get an affidavit for me, which she succeeded. I had an uncle there who had money, and, uh, so she got an affidavit, and I had to go to the American consul, and you know, you have to swear that you don't kill the president, and that you haven't been in jail, so I had been in jail, so the consul said, ah, oh, that's nothing, forget it. And uh, so I got a visa, I mean, so I got the affidavit. So now, again, the joint helped. And I had to get a French visa in order to go from France to England because the ship left in England in Southampton. And that was a different story because this guy that that consul or what what he was, he first gave me the visa and put the stamps on. And then suddenly he says, oh, you want to go to Palestine. You want to go to Palestine. I say, no, I don't want to go to Palestine. I don't believe you. And he crossed this thing out. I say, give me the money back for the stamps. Oh, he can't take it off. So, so finally he permitted me to go in one week from Basel to, I don't know, to La Havre or wherever I went, in the channel. And of course, you know, France as it is, nobody cares really. Once you're in there, the bureaucracy is only, it's not that serious. So I stayed in Paris for a week, and then I went to England. How long did you stay in England? I stayed in England about I would say maybe three weeks because I had to pick up the ticket and I went with the ship, Batori, I don't know if the name is anything to you. Do you know what the Batori is? That's a Polish ship and uh, Gerd Eisler escaped on it here from the States on this same ship later. And the Batori was never allowed again to land in the United States. They always had to go to Montreal. So I went to Visibatory, which was wonderful. They had a Danish steward department. The food was all Danish. 
and was run by Polish, I didn't care, had a swimming pool, and lived like a king. I ate, whoa. <laughs> so it was very, very nice. I had a wonderful time. And you arrived in the United States when? I arrived in the United States May 8th, May 8th, uh, 47. Once you arrived here, what did you do? Well, my girlfriend picked me up, but she waited behind the pillar. I didn't want to go down. I didn't know how she would look. So I, uh, and she wanted to know how I look. So well, finally we met. And uh, then the question was said to me, she said to me, well, do you want to take the subway to Elmhurst or should we take a taxi? I said, let's take a taxi. I didn't have any money. She had only just some money to pay for the taxi. So anyway, so we went to Elmhurst and there was the father and her sister. And I liked the father very much. I always did. He was a dentist and worked here as a, as a dental mechanic. And uh, he earned his money playing cards. He played bridge and Scott and all these things, and he went every weekend playing cards. And what did you do at that point? What I do, <laughs> I was very sad because everybody left in the morning for work and I had to do the dishes. So I said, that can't, I can't do that. So I wanted to, you know, everybody give you advice what your newcomer should do. So I went to an employment office and they said, well, you're not American citizen, you can't. We can't help you. Then I wanted to work as a mason. No way. You, because I had a mason apprenticeship. No way. So I went finally to a state employment office in Manhattan. And this guy, and I had drawings, which I had done in Switzerland and so on, technical drawings. So this guy says, Oh, I get you a job. Don't worry about it. And then he made a telephone call and he gave me a card and says, you go here to this consulting engineer's office. It's one Medicine Avenue. And if it is nothing, you come back. I get, get you another thing. And so I said, thank you. And I left. My English was terrible. So I went to this office and it was on the 40th floor. I've never been in such a high building. And uh, there was a Burton Cohen interviewing me and I showed him the drawings and then he said, well, are you married? I said, no. He said, you know, we still work on Saturdays. We work on Saturdays. I said, and so where do you, well, how much money do you want? I said, I don't know. And then he says, well, is $15 enough? I said, what? <laughs> I nearly jumped out of the window. $50 was a lot of money in 1947. So I started to work there on, on Monday. And on Friday, when he, or Saturday, when he gives me the money, he says, I give you $55. So that's how I started. And actually, I'm, I was still in the same job when I retired. When did you get married? I got married in February, February 6th of 1944. So in other words, Right away. Was it? Wait a moment, not 44, excuse me, excuse me, 47. Was it the same girlfriend who picked you up at the? Sure, uh, I was my girlfriend, 60, she was 16 year old in Berlin. And what was her name? Ursula, Ursula and uh, she, because we couldn't have children, she went to school and she worked as a dental assistant. And then the dentist wanted to send her to dental school, but she didn't want to do this. So she went to a two-year school, and she, was, she did very, very well. She was always an excellent student. And when she finished, she got a job in Farmingdale as an assistant instructor in dental hygiene in State University in Farmingdale. And uh, then she says, you know, once I do this, I should really do a little better. And, and she went to NYU and she got a bachelor and a master's and a PhD. And then she became 
first she was a professor there, a full professor, and then she became a dean of instruction. And then she applied for a presidency and became president of college and had 12,000 students. Okay. So now that you have told your story, or at least most of it, tell me how you feel your experience has affected your life, the way you led your life. Well, I, I never question any more. Uh, the most important thing is that one live today. What happened tomorrow, who knows. But uh, I, uh, I find it very important to stick around with young people because uh, that's really where the future is. And uh, so we have, we traveled quite a lot. And, uh, and you see my wife having students. I knew a lot of young people. And uh, that was a great, great help, really. And you have to be flexible. You can't, uh, you know, you can't stay, stand still and, and, and uh, go gray, gray hair. I mean, you get that anyway, but... Uh, so, that was very, very important to be alive. That's really what it is. Do you have a message to those young people that you're talking yes, about? Yes, stay alive. Work, work, but stay alive and enjoy life. Stay away from drugs. Unfortunately, I smoked very much and a long time. But that, in this country, really, smoking has, has almost died out except for young people. That's a tragedy. But when you travel in Europe, the smoking is absolutely terrible. You can asphyxiate in a restaurant. Anything else you'd like to add? For the kids? In general. In general. I, I think one, one should look at the good side, at the hopeful side of life. And one has to stay in contact with life, and with life the way it is. And uh, I think education is one of the most important things, because that's something you have for your whole life that nurtures you any time. Why did you decide to make this tape? because I, <laughs> I read about Shaw, Shaw and, and I feel that our, our message is a very important one because we will be all dead, the people who lived through this time, in quite a short order. And uh, it's very important that this is staying alive in a way. And I, my message, too, is that there's not only Nazis or bad people, but there are a lot of good people, because without them, I wouldn't be alive. So, and my, uh, I was maybe only lucky. So, that's, that's it, I mean, I would say. Well, thank you very much, sir. You're so welcome. I thank you. Mr. Schwerin, could you tell us something about this picture? This picture is a great-great-grandmother of mine. She was born in 1824, and she died in 1849, and uh, she had two sons. But this picture is an enamel painting, really, because they did not have photography at that time. They had only the daguerreotypes. The picture came to me in a, in a very strange way, namely in, in Hitler's dining car in the second, in the, in the uh, ceiling of Hitler's dining car. After the war, which was a strange thing, because the following thing happened to me. Uh, one day I was in my room in Basel when uh, somebody knocked on my door, and it was a person in civilian clothing, and he says, I bring you regards from your mother from Berlin. I'm a brakeman on a train, on a, on a salon car, uh, from Berlin because the, the, um, the British general is married to a woman from Basel, and he's ever so often in Basel. 
So if you want to send your mother something, then I'll take it along. So that, so I did that. And but then he said to me, "Why don't you come and to Francis and Barnov and have coffee and cake with me in, in in the car?" I said, "Sure." So I went there, and to my biggest surprise, he came in the salon car of the daughter of the Queen Victoria, who was married to the Kaiser, who was only a Kaiser 96 uh, days, because he w had cancer. But his, this car was in the museum, in the Overworld Museum in Berlin, and my father was good enough to take me to the museum, and I was going with felt, felt uh, pantoufles through, this, through the car. And now here I'm sitting in the same car, and have coffee and cake. This is really strange. Well, the next time this brakeman came, or the general came, and the brakeman was with him, he came in Hitler's dining car. And out of the double ceiling came all kinds of letters and books and pictures. My mother sent, and this is one of the pictures. What kind of letters? Beg your pardon? What kind of letters are you talking about? Letters. All the love letters of this lady and her tutor, whom she later married, came with in, in one of the boxes, and I still have them here. And uh, she writes in a very, very fine script, which I can't even read. But my father, when he was not allowed to practice, uh, translated or rather typed all these letters. And he, he made one copy for each of the kids of us. So he had three copies, so I have one of them. This is Parrot Liza Abraham. He was a, a merchant. And he was born in, 19, in 1798 in Dresden, which is a, a little town on the River Oder. And he died 1882 in Berlin. And uh, he must have been quite a gentleman from the picture. So he is, how is he? He is my ur-grandfather. Ur Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. This is a, a certificate of, of the year 1853, which certifies that my father's grandfather was uh, was admitted to be a merchant in in Berlin, and that's really all it is. It is an uh, official certificate. Uh, this is my father Hans, and his sister Martha, in uh, approximately taken in nineteen in eighteen eighty two. My father uh, was killed in Auschwitz, and his sister died in Shanghai of uh, some sickness because they immigrated to Shanghai. Where was this picture taken? That in Berlin. I don't know where, but it was taken in Berlin. This is my father during the First World War in Poland or Russia. I do not know who the other gentleman is. My father was a physician in the army. Which one is your father? The one with the uh, armband, with the, with the red cross uh, band around his arm. This is the Iron Cross, which was rewarded to my father. I do not know which year, but uh, most likely 1915. And, uh, well, he wasn't uh, proud about it. He was not proud about it, especially not after what happened later with Hitler. This picture uh, shows my, my mother and my older sister as a little girl in Berlin. The year must have been roughly 1920, 1919. This is your mother, whose name was? My mother's name was Erna. And the sister's name? My sister's name was Anna-Marie, 
and uh, she left. She went in 1934 to study in Paris, and she lived in France, and then was deported to Gurs. She was in camp in Gurs for a while, came out of this camp, and married a Frenchman. But she was deported, and I don't know where to, most likely to Auschwitz, and never returned. And I could never find her husband. This shows my second mother and myself when I was probably four, five years old. Uh, my second mother was a nurse in the Second World War, in the First World War, and that's how my father met her. And they married in 1924. I was born in 1919, so I was probably there five, six years old. This is a Jewish star, the star of da David, which <laughs> we called Pula Samit, because the highest order, the highest medal you could wear, you could get in the war was a Pula Merit, which means for, for value, for, for valor. And this we call Pula the Samit, because it's for Jews. I carried that star all from Berlin. I had it in my wallet in uh, Switzerland, and I have it in my wallet now. This is an identification paper that everybody had to wear, uh, carry in Germany. The only difference was in for the Jews, they put a big J on it. This is the inside of this Ken Carter, as it was called, and it gives you the particulars on the left side, pictures on the right side, with, with fingerprints, and then you have a, a stamp on there with a, which you had to pay for. So obviously, they made money on this thing too. That's it. In Switzerland, as well as in Germany, anybody who moved from one place to the other had to be reported to the police. This is a report to the Swiss police from the, from the labor camp in Merlin uh, for myself, this is a report. This is a picture of my younger sister, and, and it's taken in, in the States already after she come, came to the States. She was sent by children's transport to England in 1939. When I met her, she visited me in Switzerland. She couldn't speak German, I couldn't speak English. When, when she came to the States, she, she was a nurse in, in England. She worked as a nurse here. And when she came to the States, she first lived with us, and later she married, and she lives now in Princeton. This is a, a picture of my, my wife, taken in when she was president of the college, of the technical college in, in, in Brooklyn, New York City Tech, and it's one of the official pictures taken by the uh, college photographer. What was her name and when was this taken? This was taken most likely, her name, my na her name is Ursula, and uh, this probably was taken in 72, 76, se 1976, I would say. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.